Okay, we're back to recording some video on Peter this time staying with the holiness of God theme or the holiness theme we're into the second chapter of second Peter so the holiness of knowing our Lord and Savior is what I've entitled this and yeah sure I'm stretching things a bit here <clears throat> Almost this entire chapter is, well, is devoted to those who do not know our Lord and Savior. With the puzzling exception of verse 20, that suggests an even worse destruction of someone that might have known, might have known our Lord and Savior at one time and then bailed. What's with that, right? Kind of sounds like our Hebrews of earlier, right? And of course... The very sturdy Shriner really shines here. He shines with his Calvinism. Just like Bunyan. John Bunyan only really started to shine when he finally embraced Calvinism. He emerged from his hyper-conflicted state only when he properly embraced the implications of election. Yeah, implications that are missing from his... from. Bunyan's much beloved commentary on Galatians written by Luther. Yeah, it's a great commentary. It was, uh, I think maybe Luther's favorite is what, from what I read. And when he embraced a proper understanding of the non-election of Esau of Hebrews 12, 16. When he embraced a proper understanding of the unforgivable sin of Esau so to speak. A sin that Bunyan could improperly identify with previously. But thankfully, Bunyan was finally relieved by a proper understanding of the unchangeable things of God instead. Hebrews 6, 18. And that, well, Luther only made reference to Hebrews 6, 6 in that commentary, so, eh, Bunyan can be forgiven. <laughs> Not really. But Bunyan was finally relieved by finally embracing the sovereignty of God. Yeah. When Bunyan admittedly embraced that this falling away of Esau's was a complete falling away, a total bailout by Esau. That this falling away was an open falling away, a highly public bailout by Esau. And third, that this, this blindness, this hardness, and impenitence was an unrelenting bailout by Esau. And you read that in the Grace Abounding to Sinners, which is a pretty fantastic read. And uh, this was quite contrary to Bunyan's incomplete, private, and vacillating impenitence. A vacillating that so very, very many of God's elect are sadly prone to do, leading them to a certain dissonance. <sighs> to that end, we have Shriner going long and hard on that reoccurring election topic of verse 1. Yeah, see also verse 1 of Peter's first letter. Going long and hard on a limited atonement. Uh -huh, the L. The L in the Reformed acronym TULIP, limited atonement here, as opposed to a universal atonement, alleged to have been affected by the blood of Jesus by our modern day universalists. Yeah, and contrary to Tom, contrary to our, our beloved Shriner, a universalism likely not intended by the otherwise sound theologian John Owen. Instead, Owen was a staunch Calvinist, Calvinist Puritan with admittedly poor writing skills, yeah, like mine, despite coming from Queen's College at Oxford. Yeah, just try reading the brutal death of death in the death of Christ, for instance, and see if you don't struggle with that. Now, it may surprise you that despite Bunyan's wife appealing to the magistrate for the release of her husband from prison, it was actually the great theologian John Owen that procured the release of his dear friend and fellow Calvinist. And you can read that in Greaves in his Glimpses of Glory. Fantastic read. It was Owen 
that procured an order from Lord Finch to liberate our beloved Bunyan. Chancellor Finch forced Professor Borlow's hand in liberating Bunyan. Liberate or you're fired from Queens, perhaps. Then we have Schreiner going long and hard on the phrase, denying the sovereign lord that bought them, of our first verse, insisting that this is strictly phenomenological language, not an actual phenomena. And <laughs> yeah, difficult language of that. To that end, I would submit that the phrase is typical marketplace language, referring to a common phenomena that occurred with the buying of slaves back then. Language which Peter used yet again in verse 19. Language regarding the buying of well-informed slaves or mistresses by lords. As mentioned earlier, the purchasing of quite willing slaves. However, according to Schreiner, this particular type of buying always and everywhere refers to the soul in biblical literature. A buying that is ever and always effectual and never ever futile, according to Peter. And we can read that in, well, 1 Peter 1.5 and 2 Peter 1.3. So it would be horribly inconsistent for Peter to now suggest something otherwise. Inconsistent for him to now suggest a certain impotence in that primal purchase. To suggest, suggest, suggest a lack of sovereignty of the Lord. And then Schreiner bucks up his purchase argument with the phrase of Jesus saying, I never knew them. A frightening verse of Matthew 7.21. Clearly, a far intimate knowing is in mind here. A pretty strong argument from Tom, although he might have done better to pick up on Jesus saying, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Of John 15.16. Or pick up on John 10.28 and Romans 8.28, as Blum does. An argument more in keeping with the choosing aspect in question here, election aspect in question here. Regardless, the persistent Shriner returns to that election point for the final verse of this chapter, uh, and next chapter as well. So let's save, a, save some of Shriner's points for later. Next difficulty we might have with this chapter is God sending angels to hell in verse 4 where wayward angels were punished for having sexual intercourse with the daughters of men, according to Schreiner. Hardly relevant to us, but definitely, definitely giving good reason to reflect that men will certainly not escape judgment, if even angels do not escape righteous judgment for such presumed consent. Incidentally, the sending to hell is not exactly right here. This is not an actual sending to the Hebrew Sheol, the Aramaic Gehenna, or the Greek Hades, for that matter. Well, not quite yet, anyway. But rather, a temporary sending to Tartarus, or as we see in the Greek there, Tartarosis instead, contrary to the helpful liberties taken by our NIV translation. And there you can see it in our graphic. I've got that circled where the Tartarus or Tartarosis is actually in our P72 our foremost P72 manuscript and here it, well Tartarus is not a distracting sauce that you might put on your gamey fillet of fish but rather a sending of the unrighteous to an underworld instead sending them to a holding cell to await further judgment Verse 9. To that end, it should be assumed that Tartarus is a relatively gracious pit stop prior to a far greater and far longer punishment that we read about in verse 17. Far greater punishment than some super strict quarantine that we are currently experiencing. 
and, and not a place that Jesus descended to either, contrary to so, an ancient creed that most Christians are familiar with. And uh, many are considering this, this uh, Easter weekend. Next, our beloved Lot of verse 7. Hmm, there is a conundrum. Next, our beloved Lot of verse 7. Well, he was indeed righteous, like it or not. Now, this is not just a relatively righteous thing either, as some theologians seem to think. Contrary to popular uh, misanthropic misrepresentation, Lot's daughters seduced him while he was essentially unconscious. A date rape conspiracy of older days. And you wouldn't blame women if the same date rape thing happened to them now, would you? You would still call them righteous, right? And, and does taking solace in wine after just losing your wife constitute unrighteous? Yes, well, does it? Drinking some wine? Does that make you unrighteous? If that were the case, then Noah was also unrighteous for celebrating dry land, right? Well, okay. But to buttress our biblical argument, our text clearly says Lot was a righteous soul, which doesn't mean sinless at all. As if prophets and apostles are supposed to be perfectly sinless. This may be seen to be a pretty fair deduction, according to Schreiner, from God responding to the prayer of Abraham in rescuing the family of the only person in Sodom who was indeed righteous, we read in Genesis 18. For the compassion or mercy of the Lord was upon him, we read in Genesis 19, 16. Upon Lot, despite Lot facetiously offering up his daughters to the homosexual mob. In a similar sense, God will indeed rescue his elect from apostasy, or from total catastrophe, which might be the word used here, in what we read in verse 9, according to Schreiner, and not necessarily rescue their entire family either. Not necessarily like rescuing rescuing righteous Noah and his entirely the entire family as as spoken of in verse 5 of this chapter however God will rescue his elect for from the temptation to bail out completely and unrelentingly yeah that's the perseverance perseverance aspect of tulip and thank God for that rescuing there quizzers for without his rescuing, we are utterly hopeless. As Luther says here, we are like priests, monks, and nuns trying to deliver ourselves from temptation. And Sodom, it's just a kiss away, just a kiss away. When Sodom is just a, a salty looking back with desperate longing. And of course, Luther gets down on those priests and monks and nuns with respect to the authority of this chapter as well, using them as contemporary examples of those with corrupt desires and of those that despise authority. Verse 10. Examples of those that despise the grace of Christ, of those that add our ineffectual works to the gracious equation of grace alone yeah grace alone a translation in galatians that luther was improperly blasted for by roman catholics which is an example not all that surprising to calvin who opines that hardly one in ten of those who have once made a profession of christ retains a purity of faith to the end which just so happens to be a pure faith in Christ alone, through grace alone, of course. Having said that, the faithful do indeed sin, according to Calvin. But as they allow not dominion to sin, 
They do not fall away from the grace of God, nor do they renounce the profession of sound doctrine which they once have embraced, which would be an unrelenting renouncing of Christ, of course. So hardly unforgivable sins, unlike those of pigs and dogs that we read of in verse 22. But that is hardly fair, is it? Pigs only do what they're supposed to do. Right, Sproul? They have no souls, unlike humans who were made in God's image. So, understandably, there is no eternal punishment awaiting for those unreasoning animals of verse 12. Whereas man, well, man will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done, we read in verse 13. That phrase sounds pretty awkward now, doesn't it? Yet, <laughs> Peter was being more than just a little punny with that punishment wording there. He was being more than memorable. Just as he was being more than memorable with the apparently strange logic, according to Schreiner, of repaying evil with evil and insult with insult of his first letter, we read in 1 Peter 3.9. And naturally, skeptics don't approve of Peter's bunniness, nor do they approve of his constant references to illicit sex. Just like they don't like Paul or the brother of Jesus taking great issue with those perverted pests as Calvin calls them, who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. So, skipping over numerous more verses regarding licentiousness from the likely estranged Peter. Yeah, he probably wasn't with his wife at the time. Let's finish with those pigs and dogs of verse 22. Let's finish with animals that never, ever, were never, ever clean. That were never allowed to be eaten by Old Testament Jews at any rate. Now, the sow that was washed is likely not referring to baptism. That's a very different Greek word. Or if it is, it is referring strictly to a physical baptism. No spiritual baptism is, is implied. So no election is suggested here whatsoever. Now, one item that Schreiner, and a terribly confusing Berean literal Bible, might have interpreted on his, is, might have improved on in his commentary, is his confusing term, last state. With the term last, or eschata, in all likelihood referring to the final state, rather than the immediately resulting state. Yeah, see our, our greatest lexicon for that. The immediately resulting state would have looked a whole lot more like tote rather than eschata. Yeah, a far less final word that Peter will be using in our next chapter. So Peter is actually referring to something very final. And quite helpfully, our NIV translates this as last, as, as at the end. That's helpful. So the sow wallowing in the mud is very likely where that sow will remain in the end. That defiant Piggly Wiggly is not likely to get its butt washed ever again. Much more likely to get its butt chops barbecued instead. Incidentally, the Greek word immediately following the word last happens to be the Greek word Corona. Corona. Doesn't that sound familiar? Uh, the Greek word means worse. Corona means worse. Which sounds a lot like Corona. But it's actually... But the barbecue that Peter is actually... That Peter is about to talk about at length is much, much worse than some, some batty virus that we're experiencing. And then Schreiner completes this chapter with more comments regarding election. Completes it with the go-to verse of John who says, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if 
they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but the going showed that none of them belonged to us. 1 John 2.19 A verse definitely referring to the last, very last hour of the previous verse. Definitely referring to the very last hour and not to some irrelevant hour somewhere in between. An hour that has a direct bearing on that election word that is being stressed repeatedly by Peter. But more so, an hour that has vital bearing on the intimate knowing of our Lord and Savior. Knowing Him at the end. Knowing Him at the very end. May you know him.